Welcome to the Final Fortune Podcast. I'm Freedom Waffle. And I'm Memo. This is a podcast focused around tournament CDH and helping you become a better player. We will not only take a look at the most recent tournaments, but we will also use our experience to break down advanced CDH concepts. Let's kick off with a quick recap of some recent tournaments. The first tournament I want to talk about today is Helenium Masters. It was a little private Discord tournament I attended, which was 26 players, and I was expecting a lot of turbo decks. As it turned out, almost 30% of the meta was Rock Silas. Some of those Rockstar players are the best Rockstar players out there. First place had a chance at winning a 7th edition Final Fortune foil. Uh, I really wanted to win that. Initially, I wanted to play my Turbo Nagila version, which I'm known for, because I'm really comfortable with the deck. But this deck actually has a very bad matchup versus Turbo, because you just the slowest Turbo deck. So, me and a couple of friends decided to spice things up and actually brew Dex Nagila, which started off as a meme. But the longer we brewed, the more we realized how strong the Stax Najila game plan actually is if your opponents are playing very greedy and full on turbo mode. The game plan of the deck is pretty straightforward. We try to play and turn one Stax piece and then try to develop an Agila game plan with either another Stax piece or follow up with like a strong warrior like Samut, for example, or just another value engine. I also added some silver bullets mainly for the meme like angels grace or endurance but they actually become pretty relevant in the tournament and won me some games obviously a little bit of luck was involved but still i'm pretty proud of myself i took down the whole tournament secured my final fortune by yeah just putting a mangle horn on the stack and praying that they can't remove it which worked out the second tournament we want to talk about today is a tale of mythics and legends at mythic games in littleton colorado this was a 2k event and it was 54 players. This is on January 6th, though, right at the beginning of the year. Um, I played Tim Nekrom, and this was a pretty open meta. There was definitely a lot of meta decks, lots of Kinnon, lots of Tim Nekrom, Tivit, and Wounded Satellite and Temujin were also playing in this tournament. And all three of us ended up in the top four of the event. It was kind of funny. We went out to breakfast together and joked about maybe getting top four, but it actually came true. So that was pretty cool. So crazy. <laughs> it was wild. Um, so super fun event. Definitely plan on going back if they have some more bigger tournaments. But yeah, I ended up taking first with the tournament on Tim Nekrom on my good soup list that I've been playing for a while now. And yeah, Tim Nekrom has been consistently performing, just having a very pivotable mid-range plan with all the good guards in the format turns out is a good strategy Dargo, definitely excited Dargo trust us in shambles <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll switch back <laughs> to Dargo soon just you wait <laughs> <laughs> and the third tournament we want to talk about today is the first Mox Masters of the year Mox Masters January they had a wild top four 140 signups this is like a large event for online events most of the time they are like around 100 to 120 but 140 is pretty large number. The top four was pretty wild. We had double Raktos, Max P and his podcast co-host Max Sternberg were on Florian and Obnixilis. I think both of them are like on turbo-ish Raktos game plan. And then we had Imani on Marneos Kalgar. So Esper control, Esper My pet range. deck. Oh my and gosh. I'm so happy to see it. <laughs> Your pet card for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Evan tries to convince me to play Moneos Kalga. I, I just, it just keeps winning. I'm telling you. <laughs> 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 and then taking down the whole tournament, Jacob, aka the world, took it down with a deck. Yes, some called that, including me, I think. <laughs> Rak Sakashima won the whole thing. Incredible run. Congrats to the world for taking down the very first Mox Masters in 2024. We are joined by surprise guest Comedian MTG after winning The Boil last weekend, January 27th, which was the largest CEDH event in North American history, which is super cool. So thanks for being here, Ian. Yeah, thank you for having me, friend. So I just have a couple quick questions. Uh, the first question is, why did you choose Kinnon for this event? Yeah, so Kingdom was definitely my most represented deck of 2023, and while, you know, it's sort of my MO to ping pong around decks like a crazy person, uh, it's definitely the deck I played the most. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before, and I was like, there's there used to be so fewer tournaments uh, back in the day, so even though I'd brought a deck like five or six times last year, that was like a lot of tournaments. <laughs> so, uh, Kinnon felt very comfortable. It's a deck I'm very comfortable playing. Uh, it has one of the highest ceilings, I think, of any deck in CEDH period. Uh, I'm also more of a creature combo guy, 
die. So as much as I recognize the strength of things like Tevesh, uh, Krom, and Blue Farm, and all those things, I, I'd rather play the other top three in the deck, uh, top three deck in the format, which in my opinion is is Kinnon. So uh, comfortable deck, very powerful. Uh, the fact that it keeps coming down, even though it gets blown up multiple times and, and producing a ridiculous amount of mana is pretty strong. Also it allows you to sort of pivot pretty aggressively, which is nice. Absolutely. And obviously it paid off and we saw yeah. just how strong <laughs> even, you know, dropping one big creature, Consecrated Sphinx, immediately mm -hmm. won you the game in the finals. Right, right. So yeah, the pivot plan is insane. Um, I want to ask about a little play that happened in yeah. that top four, which, uh, so Wounded Satellite and I mold pretty mm -hmm. low and the Sauron player, mm -hmm. I believe keeps a seven or at least keeps a high. Uh, I think he was also at five. Yeah. Was he at five? Okay. Well, you're the only one who kept seven, um, but you're going last, and your turn one Sol Ring gets misstepped by the Sauron player. What was going through your mind? Uh, well, what the the people at home doesn't don't see is the like seventy points of psychic damage that that play inflicted upon yep. me. Uh, no, but <laughs> for sure, it was definitely. Uh, it caught me off guard, especially seeing as you had just played an Esper Sentinel, which to me is like that and Remora are sort of the auto missteps of the format. Right. Uh, so the fact that that had snuck by and, and my Soul Ring got eight was definitely not something I was expecting. And definitely, uh, you know, it's one of those things that like just puts you on tilt, right? A little bit. Um, it's 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 hard to, you know, in the finals match, especially you're not expecting plays like that to be happening, right? Definitely was not a play I would consider optimal given the moment, right? Um, and then it's about adapting from that point, right? I mean, I literally <laughs> think I played a delighted halfling and passed with no land drop the turn after that, and then I got a springleaf drum out, right? So like, took took a while to recover from from that position, and uh, you know, in in other circumstances, I can definitely see like letting it get you so you're playing sloppy for the rest of the game, right? But my my intent with myself was to be like, yeah, that sucked a little bit, like take the time, cool off, just do what you can at the table in the meantime and then you know hope you can recover <laughs> absolutely that's all you can do because yeah. at the end of the day you're still there to win even if they screw mm -hmm. you over like you know yeah. if you if you let it get to you then yep. you are the only one who's going to be hurt by yeah. it at the end of the day so i think absolutely, that's absolutely absolutely and and i can't think of like so many times in, in older tournaments where like things have just been not going my way but like had i kept focus for one more second i would have finally been able to dig out of a tough situation or something like that right so you know the, you never consider yourself out because a lot of people looked at that finals match and would have been like yeah ian's not even in this game until the very end right absolutely but you dropped the sphinx and took off <laughs> from there so obviously you've been present in cdh competing in cdh winning in cdh for a long time now and i wanted to ask how do you feel the meta has shifted versus like a year ago to now? Like this is the largest oh, yeah. tournament we've had in North America. Mm -hmm. what, what do you feel? Where do you feel the meta is at right now? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, was it July of last year? Lord of the Rings came and changed mm -hmm. the entire format forever, right? Like yeah. <laughs> Bowmaster, man. <laughs> um, yeah. OBM that it sort of flipped the entire thing on its head, right? I think a year ago I would have told you Winoda is a really good deck. Like I think I would have told you right. a lot of different things, right? Um, Cause I think, uh, uh, a little so I guess 14 months ago I top forward with Winota when I was like stuck at home with COVID at the Mox Masters right and like that's yep. that's now one of my favorite decks of all time that I just feel like I can't even play anymore right I mean the, yeah. obviously harping on Winota a lot but like it, it is pretty illustrative of how much things can change one of the quote S tier decks of the format now being considered unplayable <laughs> is Absolutely. huge right um and then you know oh I don't even know I still would have said like you know, some of the, the decks that are pretty good at grinding right now, some of the mid-range decks, I mean, I've always been a mid-range player and I've been pushing the mid-range plan for a long time and I'm glad that the format caught up a little bit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, it's been really, really fascinating just watching this format evolve into a grindier place where it is. Now, I think it's really interesting because the stuff that held down the fast decks uh, kind of got blown out of the format, but at the same time, they also, in response, we had to up the grind levels and that also changed the format pretty drastically as it was as well. So it was always going to kind of end up like this, but it definitely, you know, a year ago you were seeing a lot more stacks just as an archetype, right? I mean, that's that's been the biggest change is that damage-based archetypes, uh, yeah. stacks-based archetypes, they just, they have suffered at the hands of Orcish Bowmasters and the One Ring combined, you know? A hundred percent. And we have this, you know, I mean, it's the Ristic meta, right? Like that's what yeah, a lot of yeah. these decks are trying to do. And I do think it's yeah. a interesting that like we because i agree with you 100 percent we are in this really mid-range soup fest right yeah and yeah. it's without the stacks decks in the format i would almost you know if i wasn't present 
in, at these tournaments, I would kind of expect Turbo to have a bigger place. But in reality, yeah. like because Rhystic Study Mystic Remora is like one of the best things to be doing, yeah. no one is, I mean, there's obviously Rock Size, there's obviously Turbo Deck still, but yeah. like they are not the ones that are dominating this meta. That's not what we're yeah. seeing dominate these top fours, these top 16s. Right. We are seeing TNK, Kinnon, you know, I yeah. mean, Atraxa sometimes and, and all yeah. these, like a lot of Sisses, these, these mid range decks. Um, yeah take place so i think that's really interesting it's, it's always funny too because like you used to back when the format had more like extremes to it right like extreme stacks or extreme speed right uh you would see a lot more of these like rando decks that would just be like oh right. someone got in with a minotaur type minotaur typal deck at this like you know 60 person cdh tournament because no one knew how to deal with it and no one had the answers right but nowadays that thing shows up and then they get calling ritual and then attracts a laughs the way to the bank right so that's <laughs> right, right. It's, it's just a very different time you know I will say though, we we are lucky that we still do have some of these brews. Like for example, in our top oh, yeah. Sauron. Like I don't know yeah. if you looked at that deck list, but that deck was wild. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it did not fit what like you know common uh, yeah, yeah. top CDH deck building would be. So and, and I think exactly. recently the Mox Masters we had like the Marnius yeah. and Obnix mm -hmm. and Florian and oh, yeah. Shakashima won the whole thing. Like we definitely have these right. Right. like. Yeah, I, I mean, like half of my that. yeah, half of my ethos as a player has been to absolutely continue pushing yep. those boundaries, yep. right? I showed up with six mana Narset the other yes, week. Yes, I, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing Dawn Waker again. I played Drevi. I'm playing a bunch of decks that are considered super outdated, and I'm gonna keep pushing that stuff because I do think there is interesting space to be discovered there, right? And what's kind of cool about having like a pretty defined meta game is that you can find ways to attack it, right? And you can update things accordingly, mm -hmm. right? For for six months there, I think a lot of us were floundering in these other strategies. Strategies, but like how do we adapt to how much the format has changed but now people are starting to get it right? we're yeah. starting to figure out what 100%. things look like what things are good what things are rising above and then when you know those things right like any metagame and any card game you can start to attack those things totally and i am here for the spice <laughs> <laughs> well ian thank you so much for joining us ian I, I think you're a youtuber too where can people find you yeah yeah i'm a i'm a youtuber and full-time cedh coach so you can find me over at youtube.com slash comedian mtg and there you can find all my contact info as well if you're interested in any of that stuff i will leave all that in the description below as well so make sure to check ian out thank you for having me so definitely some really cool tournaments recently super stoked to see that some non-meta decks like marnius kalgar florian krakashima <laughs> even are still able to compete and perform in these events memo how do you how do you feel about the current meta do you think we're in a good spot and do you think we're where, where do you think we're slanted mid-range turbo stacks i think it's still a yeah, mid-range hell some might say um but honestly like if a deck can take down a 130 person event with like looping ponders when there are bowmasters everywhere around the corner i think the meta is it's pretty balanced, honestly. Absolutely. When you have a 2-2 two -two tribal deck with Orcish Bowmasters yep. <laughs> and draw engines everywhere, it's kind of amazing that he was able to perform so well. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that like... Like versus three black decks, right? Absolutely. So all three of his opponents in the finals were on um, were on Bowmasters or like also yep. like... And tons Marnie of removal probably. probably. On clones. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we're, we're in a really weird spot here. One thing that I've been talking about with my playgroups and has been very, very much in the CDH sphere is how much Rhystic and Mystic are taking over the format, maybe should be banned, but they're mm -hmm. they're very powerful cards. We see this top four, Box Masters January, that there are two decks that are not even in blue. Uh, the two Rakdos decks. We have a Is It deck that can't even tutor <laughs> Rhystic or Mystic. Yep. They have to just, their only tutor for it is, is Mulligans, right? So mm -hmm. I do think that like, it does give some hope that the four, you know, we're not solved uh, and and broken down to just basically dockside Rhystic Mystic. It's it's definitely more than that. Like skilled pilots yep. can pick up these decks exactly. and perform, uh, and that's super cool. I'd still say like a large part of like tournament games like evolve around dockside Rhystic Mystic, and it's still often the best thing to do or to find when mulliganing. But it's like by far not the only thing you can do, and you can also like. If somebody taps out, I mean that's how Mario Summer started, right? If they if the people keep tapping out for their like turn two Rhystic study, you can just like combo kill them on turn two or turn three. If they not if they don't spike their fierce guardianship or like the force of will, you might just get there. 
Absolutely. There's still a window to go early. And of course, that's like probably why we're seeing two Rakdos decks in this top four. Um, is, <laughs> yep. You know, they, they're able to go fast. Rakdos is, I mean, if you look at Rogsai, right? Rogsai is basically just Rakdos with blue for counter spells mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. you know, making making a Brain couple freeze. things like Underworld Breach better. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, and, and maybe and, Meme Betrayal is, is also slightly overpowered, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, it's but I mean, like, at the end of the day, they're. Like basically, mm -hmm. like it's Rakdos plus Ristic, Mystic, and Counter Spells. This is like really mm -hmm. the reason, exactly. right? Um, exactly. So yeah, I, I think that it, it just gives me a little bit of hope. I do think like you know, obviously, like right now, um, I, I've been playing Blue Farm, which is considered probably the best deck in the format, and that's why I'm playing it. But I mm -hmm. think that like just the fact that we're seeing not only Blue Farm, not only Rogsai, not only Kinnon in these top fours shows that like player skill is able to put you into a position where you're able to compete with the best decks in the format. You don't have to conform if you don't want to, to the game plan. Yep. So I think, I think that's really cool. And I think that's what makes, you know, CDH pretty unique. Also, I think I want to add here is that the players like evolve and the decks evolve. So some of the best Rogsai players I know and I play with, it's not it's not anymore like about where are five mana in Ethnos. They play around like Necropotence, they play around mm -hmm. Besiege the Mirror Lines. Uh, those spells are often harder to counter than instant speed. They're easier to cast because like three black is uh, easier to cast than three colorless and two black. And Necropotence is like super busted. So we see those pilots like looking for their windows with Necro for instance and even like Tim the Chrome players are talking about putting Necropotence back into the deck, which like a couple of months ago would be like a big no-no. Right. Uh, what, what's your opinion on like Necro and TNK? Will you give it a try? Yeah, I actually have been testing it. Um, I haven't really been able to draw it much though, or had a chance okay. to tutor it much. So I, I don't have, I, my mind isn't made up. I am unsure. The issue with Necropotence and Tim the Chrome is that you are already on such a good grind plan you already are able to tutor adnaz when you want to win con mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily want adnaz every game but necro of course is super powerful when you can have it in a mulligan with some ramp right like even just you know cabal rate dark rate whatever uh getting a turn mm -hmm. one necro is busted and we are already set up to do you know busted necro things with um of course, we already have our Grixis core with, you know, uh, Breach, Dockside, etc. But yeah. we have Final Makes Fortune sense. and Born Upon the Wind already in the list that uh, most people are running. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Necro is, it to, in that case, it's an auto include as far as like, you know, the support. Again, the issue is that a lot of times our life total is already pressured because they know we're on Nas and we already mm -hmm. are able to draw cards like we want. You know, it, it's kind of like adjacent to our primary game plan. So we don't necessarily mm -hmm. want to pivot our whole strategy to it and late game it's gonna be a dead draw but i definitely have hope i know it's got the potential to be a performer i yeah. just haven't made up my yeah. mind yet <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and we had like i think we have just have to see how it like performs for the tnk players overall right if they're like if somebody it's probably getting more popular if somebody spikes a tournament with it in the list that's yep. my guess um also yeah, I'm just curious to see what happens. Like, uh, Hellenium Masters, like Angel's Grace, saved me from a Necropotence Final Fortune turn, where I literally, like, Angel's Grace in response to the Oracle trigger on the Final Fortune turn, and then I just untap and won. So, if Necro gets more popular, people will tech against it, right? Um, Absolutely. With maybe cards like Angel's Grace, or maybe, like, other stuff um, that just tries to, like, meddle with it, which is, like, not easy, because I think Necro, Necro is really tough to stop. Yeah, totally. And I think this is kind of like a discussion for me about like consistency of deck building versus like finding these silver bullets, right? Because like Necropotence mm -hmm. and Angel's Grace are both these like silver bullet cards that like in the situations mm -hmm. you want them, they do the thing and they're yeah, pretty great. unique, right? They're yep. very, very, very powerful. Yep. Even Necropotence gets around mm -hmm. like Bowmasters like very well and mm -hmm. can set you up for some amazing early effect. wins. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So super powerful. It's just... I really like deck building with with consistency but where you, yeah exactly it's just good card tribal um and, yep. and and angel's grace is one of those cards where it's like yeah even though you have these yeah. really powerful use cases a lot of the times it's a card i never want to mm -hmm. see in my hand right like and, yeah. and even yeah, sometimes fair. adnaz is that case like you know like and, and we already have mm -hmm. a bunch of these cards like like a wheel when i already have a bunch of cards in hand i don't want to see that like adnaz mm -hmm. and, I, and there's always mm -hmm. going to be cards like that even like you could even like argue like thorical or uh, obviously brain freeze led like th these are cards yes. that like we're already filling our deck with and so i'm just worried about having all these like 
these other things that just don't function if we're not mm -hmm. you know going for it or or an opponent exactly. isn't going for it so that's my yeah. only consideration there i don't i don't think that like again my mind isn't made up i've I, i'm low on angel's grace but you know i've seen it do wonders yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. there are some the pilots like shout out to twang also known as german um the goat who's like the goat and he had great success with angel's grace and tnk i am testing it in turbo Nagila now i'm not convinced honestly <laughs> but uh, like i said at the beginning Najila has a ter like a terrible matchup versus like the like all our turbo decks, and maybe I find an early interest grace in that mulligan, and maybe I save myself from a final fortune turn. Who knows? We'll see if or it stays in. But <laughs> yeah, or stop authorical, and or maybe yeah. like stop my own final fortune. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's definitely just something that we'll we'll see as the meta evolves to try these cards and. You know, it's hard to say that like we've seen these success stories, but it's like, is this how the card performs normally? Or are these outliers that have like mm -hmm. made the card look better than it is? And, and that's where I'm unsure. Cause like CDH is a game of hundred card singleton, right? So it's not like you're drawing these cards every game. Exactly. And and are sometimes you, you just draw you fourth. Yes. Right, right, <laughs> right, exactly. And like, you know, an Angel's mm -hmm. Grace on the play is always gonna be better than Angel's Grace going forth, only in that your win rate's gonna be higher going first, right? So you might win more games if you just get exactly. lucky. And, and <laughs> not that and it makes like, the card, oh, the card is amazing. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you went first. You went four first times with the risk. Like, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's hard to know, but yeah. I think yeah. that's something we'll keep an eye on. All right, our next segment is Keep of the Week, where we discuss some opening hands that either we saw or someone submitted that we find really interesting, and we'll talk about how they played out. So first up is the keep from my finals game at the Mythic Games 2K tournament. And I was going fourth, and I kept a two-lander with Lotho, Mox Amber, and Orcish Bowmasters. So at first glance, Pretty, Pretty medium mid. hand. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But the reason I kept this hand, I was against two cannons, Wounded Satellite, and another person on his exact list, no changes, and Timujin on Tibet. My thought here was, number one, this game is likely not going to end on turn two. I'm probably going to mm -hmm. untap on turn three and be okay. Right. Number two, Bowmasters is very good against Kinnon, especially if someone has a draw engine, right? Like it's able to shut down both of these Kinnon decks. I can kill all their mana dorks, kill their Kinnon, make it cost more. It's like not going to, it doesn't stop them, but it slows them down dramatically. And Tiffit's likely to put a draw engine into play. You don't know exactly what's going to happen. I'm just kind of hoping really like the reason I kept this hand especially was that I have turn two, turn one, no play, but turn two Lotho into Mox Amber, which is very powerful because immediately pays for itself. And then I'm going to be set up to have a lot of mana, assuming, you know, my Lotho sticks around for a second. So what ended up happening? was we have a turn one fish on the play from Timujin playing Tivit, which, you know, I'm not happy to see, but it does reward the keep, right? Like I kept a turn one not feeding the fish at all and turn two, yeah, I feed it once, but then I have a Bowmasters to start punishing either Tivit if he puts any, you know, an Esper into play or something like that, or uh, the Kinnon players on their Mana Dorks and their Kinnons. So, table goes around he gets fed a tiny bit wounded satellite mold to three and he kept two lands oh, and missed it oh he right. keeps mulligan low in the finals poor lad <laughs> yeah he got unlucky and i he told me that he wasn't looking for you know the nuts he was looking for a keepable hand and he just didn't find it until mm -hmm. he got to three so pretty unlucky and my hand punished it pretty bad right because i had an orcish mm -hmm. masters to kill his his mana dork mm -hmm. though i wasn't really worried about him because he molded three turn two comes around uh the fish stays timujin develops i think just a mox diamond so he's got like two mana available and i end up casting my lotho into my mox amber makes a mana and on the end step Tamujin casts his Orcish Bowmasters, right? Oh no. Um, so I'm like, okay, there goes my Lotho. But I'm also pretty happy to see this, right? Because Lotho kind of did his job, uh, made me mana. And I think yeah. I drew my draws were like lands, I'm pretty sure. So mm -hmm. I like was I was gonna mm -hmm. make my land drops, which is you know pretty good because I cast my Orcish Bowmasters, immediately kill his, right? So he ended up yeah. just getting really rewarded that like immediately was able to take yep. off his Orcish Bowmasters. And I then have two one ones, which now I'm able to start clearing the board that I can put into Timna draws because I clear mm -hmm. the board and then I'm able to get my Timna and yeah. draw at least to a turn right away. And that worked out really well. I was yeah, really, I agree. unfortunately as long as, long as you, you hit your third land there in the first couple of draws, yep. you're pretty much golden. If like it, obviously you would love to untap with Lotho, right? But mm -hmm. that's not how it is. You'd rather like who knows, like if he 
sandbags the bowmasters even more, and you flash in yours, and then he flashes his thin. Uh, he flashes in his on top. That's way worse for you, right? So yep. Just throw the Lotho there under the bus and untap with an army and your your uh, bowmasters for sure. Absolutely, and and the bowmaster ended up doing a lot of work. Interestingly enough, like that game, I I uh, had a one of my lands was a Forbidden Orchard, and so. It, which is kind of interesting in Timnacom because you do care about combat, but you also are a four color deck, mm -hmm. right? So you really need your mana online. And it did end up reducing a couple draws with Timna because I had to keep giving, I think I kept wounded satellite most of the most of the one ones, mm -hmm. but the Bowmaster was able to clear it at the same time. And I ended up like still drawing enough with Timna and eventually won the game with Adnaz with a bunch of counter backup. The, the first Kinnon player was able to go for a win and mm -hmm. into the fish of Tamushin and he started the counter war. I backed him up a little bit, but I was sandbagging. And then after like this, Timujin used two counter spells. I fired off my Nas with double backup and then won the Let's game. Let's fucking go. Um, Love to see it. Yeah. So, Congrats again, buddy. And, and, and again, interestingly, like looking back at the keep, right? We had, it is off the, the back of Bowmasters and Lotho. Lotho barely did anything, mm -hmm. but Bowmasters cleared the way and allowed me to get my Timna game plan online. Uh, and Timna is really what got me the win eventually yep. because I was able to draw what I needed to get, you know, the mana and, yep. and, counters to protect my Nas. So, you know, it's a mid hand that like in a mid range pod, a slow mid range pod ended up working out. Yeah. And also I think you're going fourth anyway, right? And then who knows how good the five is? <laughs> like, right. do you, I'm, you're never mulling for like an early Nas in that pot, right? No. Going fourth no, versus no, 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 triple, no. triple blue opponents. You're arguably the fastest deck at the table. You're the only red deck at the table. Yep. They might suggest you like mull for a dock side and like this all gets a lot like there's a huge blowout potential and just the, the fact that you understood how good the bowmasters versus the two green decks is um it's just like perfect on point right, right? and like the tivot player drew cards you punished the kinnon players for it uh, which is also something people are criticizing that often the decks that aren't even like feeding the bowmasters are suffering <laughs> right. from the bowmasters getting fed, which is like fair, but that's how the card is. <laughs> that's yep. how it is, and yep. yeah. No, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, it, it's yeah. definitely an interesting um, situation. Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. Well, I think you had Ready. a interesting keep as well. I think we'll do mm -hmm. two keeps of the week this week. Uh, do you want to tell yeah. us about uh, yep. about your keep? Yep. So I was going fourth, and first player was Kinnan. Then second player was Talion, and the third player was also Kinnan. And I was going fourth on Turbo Nagila, and I kept my second seven, which I was very happy with. It was a Gemstone Cavern, a Underground Sea, a Bloodstained Mire, and a Boseju, so four lands. Might sound a little sus, but the other three <laughs> cards are bangers. The Dockside, a Grim Hireling, and a Snap. <laughs> so my thinking was, have early ramp in form of the Gemstone. Um, I have two Kinnan decks and Italian, and I know Kinnan can go Land Dork Pass, but I don't know why they, they, they always have all the artifacts. So I'm super happy to see Dockside versus Kinnan. This is like obviously one of the best cards anyway, but versus Kinnan specifically and a non, uh, non green deck like Talion, I was just very happy to have a turn one Dockside. So my reasoning behind the keep was I ditch a land to the gemstone go turn one dock side if it makes enough treasures. If it doesn't make enough treasures yet, I can keep up my Poseidon turn one and maybe I have to Poseidon one of the basalts if one of the Kinnan players has like a like busted start and like has just a turn two basalt. Um, which isn't wouldn't be like great, but I think like turn two Poseidon would be okay. And then untap turn three, hopefully, um, at untap turn two, sorry, hopefully then my dock side is good enough to just develop Najila into Grim Hireling, or we just play the Najila and send back Dockside into Grim Hireling for another turn, because there's also a cute synergy. Sometimes you can go Dockside, Grim Hireling, activate Grim Hireling to kill like a Kinnan, for example, right? And yeah, the game started. We had a turn one Kinnan from on the play with the Chromox. Then Talion went fish plus three artifact. And then the other Kinnan player was like, okay, I'm gonna feed him some cards, guys, I'm sorry. And then he fed them like three cards. He went like Mana Vault Soul Ring, Spells Guide, and something else that triggered Remora. Uh, Spells Guide is obviously a creature. So the Dockside count was eight. So I untapped, oh my I and I, my draw was nutty. I drew the final fortune. <laughs> and then I went Dockside for eight. 
uh, casted Najila, went down to five treasures, and yeah, uh, casted the final fortune, and it resolved. Uh, Remora didn't draw an answer. I went to my extra turn. I casted the Grim Hireling. Still had like one or two treasures left, and just went to combat. And yeah. And boom, turn, turn one win. I was, one win. <laughs> yeah, there was a little bit of luck involved, but I think like. Jokes aside, even if I don't draw the final fortune, I think I'm super good, right? I just go Dockside Najila pass. I have a snap up for interaction. Or like to clear a blocker in the end step. And like even on my next turn, casting the Grim Hireling and then threatening to kill the table is probably still solid. Even if there is a cannon and a spell scout. Um obviously I was happy that I found my window there, but I th I think it was even a reasonable keep without um, knowing that I would draw the final fortune there. Oh, yeah. See, here's here's the difference between my keep and, and Memo's keep. Memo's keep was gas. Mine was mid, <laughs> but both paid off. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we want to move on to talking about some upcoming events. So I'm going to attend the Balloon Con 2 in like three weeks. Uh, this will be the biggest CDH event in Germany thus far. Nice. CDH Deutschland um, is hosting it. Uh, 120 players. It's also kept, and it's gonna be huge. And I'm really hoping to take it down and take a tropical island with me, <laughs> <laughs> and no, or at least a cool playmat for top 16. We'll see. Oh no, no, we'll no! no. I believe goes. in you. You're gonna win the whole thing. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> the last event that both of us are gonna be at is Punt City 3. I believe this is Memo's first time coming to the United States. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. My visa is already cleared. Everything is good. I'm super excited. Two more months. Eminence Gaming is flying me out to attend Pan City 3. I'm very grateful and incredibly excited to meet you and like everyone else there. Shake hands, take selfies, and just compete with some of the best players in the world. I'm so excited. That's going to be on in person. <laughs> April 6th. Yep, in not, person. Not online. Finally, yeah, that's going to be so great. Memo, our webcam god, can meet us in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, going to be great. Super excited. And that's going to be on April 6th, 2024 in Phoenixville, Philadelphia. So that's going to be really exciting. And this is it for our first episode of the Final Fortune podcast. I'm Memo. And I'm Freedom Waffle. If you'd like to up your game even more, you can reach out to us for CDH coaching on our socials. Links in the description below. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.